Because we were a small faculty at this time, uh, I got to do things as a junior faculty that, that probably were a junior faculty. So one of the things immediately that I had to do was to become a member of So at St. Louis, you have to apply to become a member of graduate faculties. When you teach, I get to apply for it. Uh, my dirty secrets is that I was denied the first time. Uh, so it took me a couple of months to get into the graduate faculty. Uh, but then I was also a member of the graduate committee which was responsible for shaping the master's program. But it's here where I really fell in love with graduate. Having opportunity. So for those of you who just don't want to kind of quantitate the person through the numbers. Uh, so I've been here just a little over five years. Uh, but within those five years I've been on Masters of Committees uh, and four co authored both at the end. Um, and what I really love about the experience again, within those five years, the kind of dissertation, the advertising, right, for uh, Native American currencies. Um, or how video games, uh, how Ghanaian oil companies are strategizing to exploit communities in Africa. Um, these are things that are outside my direct realm of research. It's both like um, I think it makes for a much more rich. Um, I guess one of the more important numbers I want to think about is 25 years. How old our graduate program? Uh, and it's an important moment for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first, it's an opportunity of reflection. An opportunity to stop and think, okay, what are we doing? What can we do better? How can we evolve to become a better program? Uh, so all of those things, I think, are moments of as we'll talk about later, also to showcase the program that we have. The excitement around the program. So with that said, uh, I want to talk about if, if this position were to be offered and some of the priorities that I was set, the way that I've broken it up into three key areas, academic development and professional development. Going into our program, uh, what is graduate students you experience while you're here at our program, uh, and then once you leave our program, how are you best positioned to see uh, beyond that? So, also. so recruitment. Uh, and this is something that became apparent, especially in this year, where the number of qualified applications were down. Uh, so what we want to do is correct that and see the, the higher number of qualified. Uh, and all of that creates uh, an incentive to, to generate more programs. Um, advertising in a doctoral program, special masters, they operate under slightly different principles. Um, but one of the things I think that we, we should do is um, enhancing the reputation of our program by showcasing the work that we do. Uh, when we look at the measures of what makes a successful graduate program, communications, academic reputations, that, um, and so we have productive researchers here already. Uh, we've grown exponentially in the five years that I've been here. Really prolific researchers, in addition to the faculty that have been here for, uh, that are prolific researchers. There was a moment a couple of years ago uh, where Janet, Kim, and Q were the heads of some of the largest organizations. Um, we should be leveraging that, we should be celebrating that, we should be showcasing that, uh, because that in turn will generate interest in the program. Um, at the same time, again, there's a lot of great work that is coming out of our graduate students. Um, graduate students that are competing capably for fellowships, uh, for great lines, for grants, uh, not just within the program, but beyond. Uh, this is where it should also be showcased. A lot of our graduate students are traveling all over the world to conduct interesting science and development that we get here. This should be showcased. Um, because I think when students are interested in that and it becomes more apparent that we're, we're doing great work, uh, 
that you're going to be more motivated at least look into it. Um, so should be faculty research, should be graduate research, I think you can also use the professional networks for the faculty that we have. Um, and so social media is going to become an important thing. Uh, one of the things that I want to start doing, if again, offer this position of developing a list of best practices. Uh, when I was in New York last week, for example, I had uh, a colleague of mine who has this graduate program. Uh, and we started having a conversation, it was happened that we started having a conversation about that. So already starting to get a better idea of best recruitment strategies, uh, possibly rethinking uh, conference exams, things like that. Uh, things that we can always do in the sort of system. Would you mind? Uh, this is a longer term issue. It's not something that can be solved by one person. It needs to be uh, a collaborative person. It's just crafting a piece of uh, sure. That's important. <laughs> I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> uh, just crafting a piece okay. of identity the program. Um, and again, that, that will be an ongoing process. It's not something um, a year, but it like, involve a lot of faculty. Um, so once students are in the program, again, revisiting the curriculum that they're having while they're here. Uh, and this is a moment of assessment. And what are we doing well? Uh, what could we be doing better? Are the courses that we're offering serving us in the way that we want them to be serving us? Um, what are our priorities? Uh, this is an important part of it too, is, is indeed more faculty in the program. Uh, when I listed the, the 20 dissertations, the 16 MAs, I'm ambivalent about that. On one hand, I know that I've benefited from uh, being exposed to, to many of those students, but I also know that that concentration of labor means that few people are involved in that program, right? So that's evident of that. And what we'd like to do is to use that, that labor uh, if it makes sense for junior faculty. And I know there are going to be considerations if you're junior faculty, for example, of what degree do you get involved in the graduate program? Uh, how many graduate students can you advise? Um, and so all of those things are going to be considerations. But for those of you who want to be active and engaged in the program, uh, to be able to make sure that, that those interests are diffused and reflected uh, in the curriculum. I think this is also important is just promoting a culture of scholarship, creating opportunities, hallway conversations, workshops, town halls where people can share ideas about research. Uh, people can um, bounce ideas off of each other, uh, where students can become exposed to faculty research and vice versa. Collaborations can be made. Uh, we want this to be a culture of scholarship, but also a culture of rigor. Uh, to know that part of that is that not only are we going to put the faculty there to advise students and support students, the program is there to support students, but that there's also an expectation from graduate students that they come in and they, um, they take the work seriously, that it is a culture of scholarship. There is rigor that's involved in part of this. Uh, and then formalized ways of teaching effectiveness. So once you go off into the job market for the graduate students, uh, you'll be a teacher scholar or a scholar teacher depending on the kind of organization. Uh, but to equip you in a very formalized way uh, to move through the process of taking on a class, becoming an effective teacher, moving up to the point where you have a standalone class. And finally, professional development. Sorry, Jesse, that I've done you already. It's <laughs> kind <laughs> <laughs> So, professional development. Um, so, yesterday, a graduate student came into my office and uh, it turns out they just got a fellowship. And how rewarding that was for the student, how rewarding it was for me, for successes or my successes, um, and it happens a lot. So we spent a lot of time investing in our What will be a highly competitive market? Uh, the number of tenure track jobs that are available right now is, is highly competitive. Uh, and so we want our, our students in the best positions to compete in positions, if, again, that is what they want. Um, and so how do we do that? So many of us do it on an individual basis, but there are opportunities to formalize this process. Uh, so one idea, for example, would be to identify all the students that are in the job market in a given year, um, to bracket those students, and to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with them talking about things like how do you craft a cover letter? How do you position yourself for particular jobs? Uh, how do you build networks? How do you uh, conduct yourself on a job hunt? All of those things that are important practical professional skills uh, that can make a difference between whether you get a job or not. Again, just knowing that going into this job market, it's going to be a highly competitive process. 
Um, so sponsor and promote job talks. This should be a, a no-brainer, something that automatically that goes if somebody is on the job market, that they are exposing um, their job talks, getting constructive feedback, and so forth. Uh, and then finally, just building a, a professional network with people that have already graduated from our program. Oftentimes, we can become insular. We hang out with people uh, in our own cohort sometimes or within the program itself. Uh, but we want to build not only a community here within the SOJC, but also the broader community. Uh, so that you can ask advice not only faculty, but people that may have graduated from the program five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, and so, um, so there are opportunities to do that through, through virtual means. So these are just some ideas for um, how to move the project forward, how we move the program forward. Um, I don't want to overpromise. I want to say that all of this stuff will be done in a year or that I will be the only person to do this. Uh, one of the things that I've learned that it's a collaborative process. Uh, so, for example, in teaching advertising, one of the things that I remind students is that it's never just one person that creates an ad. It could be 100 people that are involved in making it. But it takes somebody to manage that kind of talent. Uh, what I can give you is a set of guiding principles that if I were to take this, uh, how it at least approach the, the, the work. Uh, the first is just being informed, so not, not making decisions based on gut uh, or based on speculation, but making data-driven decisions. So if we want to move forward uh, in a particular direction with the doctoral program, the MA program, what is that based on? What exactly are we trying to achieve? Uh, which leads me to second is being collaborative. Again, no one person is going to do this. I think you expect one person to single-handedly uh, guide uh, the doctoral program in certain directions is unrealistic. Rather, it takes an entire effort um, for both uh, working with the dean, uh, working with the PhD advisory committee, for working with faculty at large, is going to be an important part of that process. So, bringing in as many people as possible, as well as building connect connections outside the SOJC with the school. Uh, so, it has to be a collaborative process. It has to be a transparent process. And so those of you who know me, I know that I'm very big on shared governance and faculty governance and transparency. So hopefully we can uh, To be inclusive, and by that I want to bracket it a bit different than collaboration. I mean bringing in different diverse standpoints. Uh, I think when you have diverse perspectives and intellectual diversity, uh, as well as other kinds of diversity, uh, that makes a program much more rich. And when you look also at the consistent measures of how communications programs are ranked, uh, or media studies programs are ranked, uh, diversity is often one of those measures. Diversity in terms of um, how we think about the program. Uh, and then finally, being ambitious, but also being realistic. So having wildly aggressive goal for, for what we can be and what we want. Uh, but also being realistic that it's not going to be done in a day, it's not going to be done by one. Uh, and it's also going to take the support of other people. It's going to take the support of faculty. It's going to take the support of administration. So there are going to be some temporal, economic, human resources that are going to have to be dedicated towards moving this project forward. To, again, to expect it to happen at least is not realistic, but that we need full support of, of the entire program if we want to see this program succeed. So with that, I guess I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Someone's got to break the ice. Yeah. <laughs> so, you talk about cooperating with grad students. In looking over your CV, I think I saw, and please correct me, that on those cooperative articles, you were first offered each time. Mm -hmm. What's your philosophy about how do you negotiate cooperation with graduates? Yeah, definitely. So uh, let me start back with another anecdote. When I was in graduate school, I would work on research centers where uh, his association with warranted co-authorship. And I was kind of resented it because uh, I remember a co-author wasn't really involved in that program. Um, so a couple of different things. One, uh, if I do enter a co-authorship opportunity, there has to be some convergence between the students. So, uh, if there's some sort of overlap between what their, their scholarship is and what my scholarship is. Um, at this point, if I could have a project that was ongoing or in progress, I would invite the student to come on as a same. Uh, always making sure that they got right. All those cases are already ongoing, I invite the student to come in. 
if the student had a project and wanted me to come in on this a second offer, it was their idea. They had started up the framework, but they wanted somebody else to come in and help that. Uh, I would come in as a second offer. But it was really who the idea comes from, um, who's driving the majority of that process. Um, for your presentation, I was actually one presentation of one of our graduate graduate school dean candidates, first candidate, and he talks uh, at length about this idea of career tra trajectories of grads, sort of like being very data driven and following where do they end up going, where do they end up doing, and that can lead to questions about the aligning curriculum with skill sets. And I think in her case, she was probably talking, in fact, talking more about the master's level and the fact that we train master's students primarily thinking about PhD programs, and in fact, a lot of don't go to PhD yeah. programs, but it may have some relevance too for the PhD, and just simply thinking about you know, what what types of conceptual analytical skills, in addition to maybe kind of more hard skills of data analysis and whatnot, part at a different, at different form, forms of graduate education. I wonder if you might talk a bit about that, and sort of tracking students, their trajectories, and you know, both as well as present. Yeah, that's a great point. And a couple of different things. I know this came up a lot even when I was at UOC. Uh, the number of graduate students that we would admit uh, was large. We would have often a large book of labor. Uh, at the same time, the market often often can't sustain the amount of graduate students programs are putting. So what's going to happen is that uh, unless you compete a labor, uh, you will not get a chain of traction. The, the, the chances are becoming harder and harder to do. Which means that we have to be responsible as programs thinking about alternative paths for our students. And I think that's something that we need to put more fine into. That the an academic career at a research one, while desirable, is not the end all be all. But there are other forms of rewarding career that you can happen you know, at a teaching university or an R2 or even outside of academia altogether. Um, and it's, that's a tricky part to do. So I think some thought needs to be put into that. Um, oftentimes, what happens is that uh, faculty replicate themselves. That's what we're very good at. And so we come from R1 programs. We, the expectation that we replicate that for our students, that's what we do. But I don't know if that reflects the, the marketplace right now. And so I do think we have to look at alternative In terms of graduating, um, tracking where our students need to go, I think we need to do that for a variety of reasons. One is to reach out to those folks, to bring them into the fold and engage them. But, um, because sometimes they'll, they'll start off at a research too, go into an R1, or start Two, uh, there's a lot of movement that we just need to keep down with where our students go and what they're doing. That'd be another part of that process. That's a sure. oh, uh, question on that. You know, we think about this in terms of like on ramps and off ramps, like thinking about the program as having maybe not just one on ramp, but like you do a master's and then you do a PhD, yeah. but maybe you know, more and more programs are looking at a, a direct BA to PhD, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of creating different types of on ramps for really good students. Get into programs, as well as also creating off ramps for students who probably, you know, two or three years in, they realize, the faculty realize they maybe shouldn't be there. How do we help them have a graceful exit, master's degree? Um, you know, any thoughts on those types yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. I know this came up in the GAC. Um, when there's a lot of qualified students that are coming directly from a BA program, that they could easily be great uh, PhD candidates. Um, and so we, we've kind of caught it. Uh, it as a PhD student or an MA student, being they're sort of higher. In some ways, those don't really hold up. Uh, again, when I was at USC, you got a master's after you completed your qualifying exams. So that could be an opportunity. To use. You know what? I, I don't see myself moving forward anymore. I'm exhausted. I just kind of want to take some time off. And then you leave the program with an MA. Um, or you continue to go on. Uh, and so I think those kind of offerings. Uh, and I know it's something that we've been talking about. Uh, this question also, but uh, I promise I would ask it. Um, both Jesse and I talked for like we we would love as junior high for an opportunity to see who's applying, especially if they do. Like people have been like a little surprised, like oh. Here for me, like I don't worry over something. So, mm -hmm. what is your thoughts next? What are your thoughts about like how that process could be, or if there's any possibility, like be a little bit more involved? 
in the selection process. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that, that is tricky. I mean, so I'll start with the trickiness and then ideas for possible. Um, so we get roughly, you know, between all of them, um, you know, it's, it's a selection process, and then there's kind of a debate about what kind of support we want. Um, it, it takes a lot of labor to do that. Uh, and so one of the questions is, do we want to impose that kind of labor on a necessary time set? And so there might be a couple of opportunities to do that. Like, for example, if students do mention you, uh, to, to reach out to you. You know, to see if this is the kind of research you would be doing. Because the idea that we want to do is sync up the applicants with the kind of uh, work that research um, that are active. So possibly opportunities to reach out. Um, but I, I don't know, if, you know how feasible it would be to include the entire faculty in the entire process because you'd see how unwieldy that would get. Yeah. Um, but I think there are probably have feedback mechanisms that would be Or you have to move by improve curriculum. Mm -hmm. What I'm seeing always in the call is one thing they call class very few courses. There are some, but and uh, they are always saying. But how would we out of the original? Definitely. So a couple of things that have happened since, since I've been here is that we've grown exponentially. You know, I think we have 20 some odd faculty that positions in their own uh, And so I think this is the perfect time to assess, okay, does the curriculum that we offer reflect the, the, the faculty that we have uh, or the direction that we're going in? Um, and so I would recommend an auditing process. So spend next year auditing the kind of program and the degree to which that it would it is reflective of the, the faculty that we have. So just being really thoughtful, and at that point, everything is going to be open to question. You know, we divide three, one, two, and three. Uh, does a professional teaching and practice serve us? And in so what ways? Um, you know, um, the pool camps, all of those things I think are open to question. Uh, but I think, you know, that, I would want to do a, a thoughtful audit. Again, what are we doing well? What are we doing better? What's the alignment between what we report we are uh, and a critical entity? Everything would be open to discussion. Ready? Yeah. 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 Ye
And I'm surprised that they weren't happy to uh, put you that they have connection. Yes, Percy, thanks a lot. You've answered most of our questions, and uh, also from the people who could not attend, we wanted to say we're very supportive and very pleased that you have been nominated and uh, looking forward. The main question I had was uh, essentially because I missed the first part, I don't know if you discussed how the time aspect would work. You're already teaching, you're doing a lot of stuff. So, how much of the time allotment would there be? And then again, this is an important thing, and I'm sure. To have a roadmap for the future as far as strategic directions and everything. How would that? How would this job add in or you know take away from the current work that you? Yeah, that's the, the million dollar question in terms of the negotiation <laughs> question. So uh, <laughs> the first, the first step would be to do um, on to I think the, the selection phase. I mean, we can't. I mean, pressures, uh, and then it becomes a negotiation. I would imagine that comes in for this current position. So the individual have the opportunity to work that needs to be done. Uh, so that would become part of the negotiation. But I agree with you, like to, to be able to do this to dedicate that kind of time uh, requires temporal resources. Uh, Scott? Uh, you've looked at this broadly, as you should, and you've also looked at this realistically, saying, okay, I can only get so, so much done. Um, given those parameters, what would be your highest priority? What would you? You look to get accomplished in your in your first year. Yeah, I mean, almost happened like like today. So because we're already behind on, on uh, people already applying for for next year, are thinking about it right now. Their advisors and that worries me. So I'm stressed out about that. So the immediate concern would be to uh, find ways to promote the program, increase those leads because I think we're already behind. Uh, just taking an audit of, of where we are, what we've done. Um, and then um, looking forward to the fall again, identifying those students that are going to be on the job market, starting to revisit classes, although those are pretty much you know, developed for the next year, so we'll be able to uh, do the following year. Um, but I'd say start the auditing process to the recruitment piece of it really. Concerns me not. Uh, so that's a, a resource issue. Um, so I think just generally, uh, I think it's good practice to have. Um, I think it's an issue of resources. And but I think having a post you know, like many programs. Can. I guess I should have said for great Chris. Oh, thanks. Nice. Um, it's kind of building up Gabriella's question. Yep. In order for us to offer more 600 level classes, at least from my perception, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that one of the challenges we have is we need to have course more students to fill the courses. And to do that, we need more students from outside SOJs. So, what do you think can be done in the short to medium term, either in terms of the topics that we offer, or in the way we frame the courses, or in how we market it on campus, or whatever? You know, what, what can be done to to do that, to essentially get more, I mean, we have a recruitment issue on this campus in terms yeah. of recruiting students on this campus into our classes in order to ensure that we can do something in our students. Yeah, absolutely. And so, kind of getting back to the question of an alignment between what students need and, and what students or what faculty want to teach. Uh, and I really get those cases where you have those in sync. And so, first, it's just getting a sense of what students are actually calling. Uh, and so, one of the, the biggest, you know, informal pieces of feedback that I get is like, I want to take a class in this area, but it's just not being offered. Uh, and that happens recurrently. So if someone's interested in, in um, free marketing or, or whatever it is, uh, we need to ideally be able to offer that. And we're starting to move in that direction in terms of what uh, might be more clustered. So for example, the number of students that are studying strategy or strategic communications is starting to offer those kind of classes. But I also think it's, it's worth giving faculty, uh, special research productive faculty, the opportunity to uh, and I think that becomes attractive in and of itself because you're not just teaching kind of general mass oriented courses, but you're teaching classes that have a really specific niche to it that can draw in different uh, areas of campus. So part of it, um, again, with well, this is going to be a resource issue to a degree when we promote those individual classes and make sure that they fill. Uh, but I think in the beginning phases, a lot of the onus is going to be on individual faculty members to that work to generate some conversation around it, um, which, again, I think is. is 
going to be one of the big trend games is individual faculty members who want to be engaged in the program or are engaged in the program just will have to accept some of that labor up front until we can get mechanisms in to, to um, support that. But I think ideally what you want are research productive faculty that are teaching really cool things in their area. Let me build on that just a bit, and I'm playing devil's yes. advocate here. And grad students, I'm sorry. Let me just say, I'm playing devil's advocate. <laughs> Oftentimes what happens is you get a grad student who comes in the door and is studying this, and it's a subject exactly half an inch wide. Yeah. And I want to take courses in this. How do you respond to say, this is the time to expand your horizon, take in more to understand that your career isn't going to be just that wide, that you're going to be called on to teach classes that are to review articles that maybe step outside your narrow area. How do you respond to students and get them excited about taking some of those courses? Otherwise, they say, oh, well, I'm not interested in that so much. And I do get that feedback sometimes, either in classes or, or through advising. Um, you know, I try to frame it because it's in our best interest to become um, as multifaceted as possible. Because we fast forward, I think of it very strategically in terms of fast forward four years from now, five years from now, and you're in that job market. If you are a niche, if you are so narrowly defined, and that's what you define yourself as, it becomes a lot harder to compete for a wider variety of jobs. So I think it's in everybody's best interest to have a command of multiple methodologies, a command of proficiency theories be able to pivot in multiple directions. So I think it's within students' interest to be more multifaceted. I would say, again, thinking about my own graduated piece, and that has been tremendously useful for me, uh, not only in terms of my marketability as a candidate, uh, but also as a scholar, to be able to draw on multiple traditions, to be able to make things between. Um, so the way I would frame it is just that I think it's in, in your best interest to do that. Um, again, not to, if you love X, do that, uh, but also be proficient in a wider way. But I think, yeah, that's important. It comes up quite a bit. Yeah, I'm glad you talked about the upcoming 25th anniversary. I think, um, you know, marking that our program would have something. I wonder if you've given any thoughts about what you've done. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see something straight. Um, and so Juan Carlos and I were just in New York, and one of the amazing things that happened about that is that it was the primary event, which was you had students going in for a professional in New York, and that was the primary function to expose students to. But then there was this also this secondary labor of um, engaging alumni with current students to generate enthusiasm around. It was fascinating to see because there was the primary event and there was all the heretics that came out of that event uh, that was either equally or more successful or I don't know what the right word is. Uh, and so there's a lot to that. And so I think something like the 25th year anniversary has the opportunity to serve a similar time. Uh, but we have the event itself, which is to showcase some of our, uh, you know, um, successful uh, alumni of the uh, to connect those students. But then there's also all of the, the talk that comes around it used to give our social network something to, to, uh, to generate some excitement around it. So I think that's the way to think about it. But I, would, I would want it to be celebratory, and I would want it to have an academic focus, uh, and I would want it to showcase some that, that have gone out of our program that have gone on to become vice provosts or deans of the program, things that we don't even think about. Uh, because once they leave the program, they kind of disappear, uh, which, which is um, unless we keep those individual relationships ongoing, uh, the program doesn't really know about that quite as much. But I think that's something that we want to, to make more visible and more apparent. So it's interesting that this question might not be asked by PhD students in particular. But uh, the, the quarter system uh, uh, in presents, introduces uh, challenges in terms of GE assignments. Uh, so, according to your experience, what would you do with different 
from uh, the short sensor of us. And he is uh, for the search for the fish. That's the, the, the corny is probably question and probably one of the biggest bits of contentious feedback that I have. Uh, so I'm glad that Amy is here. <laughs> so I do think if this uh, were to, to move forward, I think Amy and I would have to audit like, what's currently being done. And honestly, I don't know, uh, not having been in this position for how G assignments get assigned. Um, again, ideally what you want. So I know that there are realities of it. There are limited amount of resources. There are needs that classes have. There are certain classes that favor. Uh, versus what students want, you know, they want to teach the uh, teach in their area, they want other um, and so I think it's just I mean, a bit to the degree possible. If it were that easy, I, I, I'm sure it would have been solved already. Uh, and so I, I suspect that it's just a lot more thorny than that. Uh, but how I would attack the problem is is that uh, in collaboration with Amy would be to start to figure out okay, how is this thing? Uh, are there opportunities to have more? It is to make it more. Uh, but I know that it is a hot issue, uh, probably one of the most contentious issues there. Uh, and so, yeah. Patrick, I guess I'll ask. I'm sort of in resonance with Pat's question. I'd like to answer the G question partially. This is my view of graduate school. As students, you don't know what you're going to teach, and all things can end up being sort of helpful to you. Classes can be helpful to you and your comfort zone. She's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not subject specific to me. Um, so I guess going back on your slides, like how do you see sort of enhancing sort of the sort of early onset pedagogical There's develop curricula. We often end up we still have teachers sometimes we have to teach well, so we have to develop curricula out of nothing, or we're given a box curricula. I don't know, but I just, I'm just curious how you would sort of that sort of professional development for teaching. Yeah, yeah definitely. And actually, I remember when, when Heather was applying for our position, uh, and I was talking to her, her advisors, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, there's like a full formal process by which you become a teacher. So part of it is that you get exposed to the classroom. Uh, and then little by little, you get integrated into it to the point that you Then there are these feedback mechanisms that are involved in it. Um, so again, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a video of the feedback on it. But you evolve up to that point. And I think there just, just needs to be a lot more communication, a lot more pedagogical discussion up front about what makes a good teacher, um, workshops that, so that by the time that you walk into a classroom, you're pretty well prepared. Um, and it's just not up to your, your natural ability or what you're capable of, but we give you at least the skill sets. Yeah. Um, when I went to graduate, they sort of just threw you in, and you were surprised, right? Like, I was surprised. Like, I have this classroom, what do I do with it now? Uh, nobody ever told me if I did a good job or not until I got the evaluation. So um, that trial by fire, I, I could see being useful, but if I had my druthers, I would really want to have kind of a thoughtful classroom. Well, also the point where they can take a the classroom. Thank you. Possibly have a quarter structure question. So the quarter system has its pros and it obviously has its cons. And I think one of those for graduate education is that it's difficult to get a kind of fully fledged uh, research project completed in a 10 week term. As you see students have told me um, over the course of you're trying, to, trying to teach that. And so, you know, having come from semesters where it's a little more feasible in 15 weeks, I definitely see how it's constrained. It's up in 10. Are, do you see any sort of workarounds or ways that we can maybe? Think about courses that have continuity, or you just explore ways of taking what I see as a series of many proposals that are written, yeah. but relatively few, comparatively few papers completed and conferenced and published. Yeah. Um, given how central that is to graduate education and professionalization, do you have any ideas on how we can work around this, just the constraints of the Absolutely. And same sort of thing. I came from a semester system, and then um, my immediate solution to the problem was okay, then I'll just. Okay, 16 weeks. Awesome. And you end up having to, to just wholesale cut information all together. Um, what strikes me about this today, I thought about it, is just in terms of um, how we organize and codify time is, is arbitrary. So we have these 10 week cycles that we for the most part, and there are some institutional realities to that. This is as possible if you're rethinking, for example, we all have a year, you know, whether you call it a 16 year term or a 10 year um, Theory, for example, could be taught necessarily 
maybe formally might be three terms, but is there any way to think of it where there's some continuity over the course of a year? And maybe there might be some overlap between terms or transitioning from one form theory to another. Methods could be taught the same way. But to think less in terms of terms and more on the continuity of the year, and then figure out how to divide that information up in different ways. And I know there are institutional restraints to that, but I've got to believe there are ways around that. Uh, but to rethink how we organize time, I don't think we should or have to necessarily be beholden to the ten week term because it's imposed on us by the administration. I think you're trying to figure out how to formulate what you questioned because I did this graduate team. So um, maybe this will mm-hmm. be. The short answer. So many of the things that you've talked about just in the short all time. And maybe even, you know, some. Yeah, I mean, I think it does have to be collaborative. Uh, and again, I don't know if you're aware, I know this part of it, that shared governance is a big part of at least my identity uh, as a faculty member, so to include as many people as possible. At the same time, I know that we have a faculty of you know, very 60 different points of view. Uh, so knowing that at the end of the day, you're, you're taking different forms of feedback in, but then you have to move forward in a particular role of the coordinators to make those kind of movement in a specific direction. Um, that is well informed and is well advised. Uh, I think in this case, having a uh, thoughtful advisory committee is a great idea. The, the proposal. Uh, so that's no one person that's driving the entire vision of it, uh, but that you have, and how I would imagine this uh, thoughtful advisory committee being is representative of the school. So you know, folks from media studies, folks from uh, advertising journalism, and so forth. Uh, so to have um, intellectual diversity with that, so that we know that we're working for in a collaborative manner. Um, running stuff by the faculty is an important part of that. Uh, but again, knowing that there are practical realities for it at some point, because uh, we also want to get a little just paralyzed. Like I can imagine the question that I raised earlier of what is our, our identity as a program, I can imagine that conversation going on in perpetuity. Uh, and so, um, so at some point, you know, moving it forward. And, Um, thank you for, I'm sorry, I missed the first time but I'm curious if you can tell us what we haven't asked that you think is important for us. As graduate students? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I, I, mean, I guess the question is like, how, how do you, how, how would you be involved in this process? How would you be involved in decision making? Um, and one of the things that, to answer that question, I guess, would be, um, I just think there's more opportunities for faculty and students to interact, uh, not only at a social level, but to be become familiar with each other's work. Um, having again, like being able to, to hear from students what their needs are, what their needs are. I've been able to do that because I work with a number of graduate students on an individual basis, but having more of those opportunities here from the collective. Uh, what's going on? Because you are also having, I mean, there are conversations that are happening amongst you, but there needs to be sort of a, a dialogue between. Faculty. I guess the question would be, you know, how can you be more invested in the program? 